Support for User Defenders is provided by Adobe XD. Adobe XD reimagines how designers create user experiences for websites, mobile, and more. Try it free at userdefenders.com slash XD. How might we signal a time that's sort of like, hey, we actually could use a little human judgment here because the, the moment that an algorithm fails or becomes uncertain is exactly the right time to engage human judgment. It's not all the machines all the time. It's got to be a partnership between humans and machines because machines are terrible at some things, just like humans are terrible at some things. And how do we sort of create and encourage that partnership instead of just handing over our brains completely? Welcome to the User Defenders Podcast, where we interview UX superheroes who fight for the users in order to inspire and equip you to do the same. And now, here's your host, Jason Ogle. Greetings, User Defenders. Welcome to this very special episode all about the state of UX in AI. This was a topic suggested on Twitter by a valued listener named Sherry Banco. Thanks so much for the wonderful suggestion, Sherry. This proved to be a really great, deep, important topic. So uh, I responded to her on Twitter, something to the effect of how awesome of an idea this would be as long as I could get Josh Clark to talk with me about it. And thankfully, Josh readily agreed and enthusiastically agreed. We talk about Siri and other personal assistants, um, how to present errors, Uh, Another thing is we talk about are our jobs being threatened by AI and especially how to dive in as a UX designer into this nascent and already actually prevalent technology. We also take a very interesting stroll through Uncanny Valley and Mechanophilia, which I didn't even know existed until I started researching for this. That's all for now. There's a lot to cover in this very special episode all about the state of UX and AI. So fasten your seatbelts. The humans are still driving this conversation. I want to share an iTunes review that came through. This one's from Judy Bot, and Judy Bot says, I learned so much. Every time I listen, five stars. What a wonderful resource to stay up to date on what's going on in the web world. The host seems so friendly and genuinely interested in the guests. Oh, thank you so much, Judy Bot. Uh, And Judy Bot also said, I loved the accessibility episode with Derek Featherstone. He really practices what he preaches and his passion really shines through in the interview. Love it. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Judy Bot. Uh, I know that's not your real name, but maybe your name is Judy. Thank you, Judy, for leaving that wonderfully inspiring review and for your warm comments about me too. I, I it means a ton. So I, I that's what I really want. I want to I want to come across genuine and and real and and vulnerable and. So it's neat to know and friendly too. I, I do want to be friendly. So thanks so much for that. And, and yes, I love the episode with Derek also. It was a lot of inspiring information, especially as it relates to designing for accessibility. So thanks again for leaving that review, Judy. And uh, yeah, keep fighting on. Defenders listening, I would be honored if you take the time, just a couple minutes even, just to leave a rating and review on iTunes. It helps uh, other designers find this show, and it helps me keeping producing this content for you. So thanks in advance. Uh, you can search User Defenders or UX on iTunes, and it'll come right up for you. Josh Clark is a design leader who helps organizations build products for what's next. He's founder of the powerful design laboratory, Big Medium, a Brooklyn design studio specializing in future-friendly interfaces for artificial intelligence, connected devices, and the web. He's the author of five books, including Tapworthy and Designing for Touch. He's also a prominent blogger and speaker, the creator of the popular Couch to 5K running program, in addition to him being Maine's 11th strongest man out of 11 applicants, Josh? Uh, well, yeah, it's true. I, I was 11 out of 11, <laughs> but they can't take number 11 from me. They can't. They'll rest it from my dead hands. 
<laughs> His first onboarding project was over 20 years ago when he created the wildly popular Couch to 5K app to help skeptical would-be runners get going. The program has been since adopted by Britain's National Health Service as a national fitness program. That is awesome, Josh. And I think I even heard something about you being mentioned on a late night talk show, a popular talk show. I can't remember who it was, but that yeah, is incredible, that's right. man. That was, uh, I think it was John Stewart talking to, um, uh, uh, oh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on his name? You know, uh, risky business and mission impossible. And, uh, Oh, Tom Cruise. Oh my gosh. It was Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise and oh, John Stewart well, so cool. as both used couch to 5k go figure. That's awesome, man. What, what a neat, neat accomplishment. And that's such a, um, you know, health is so important, especially, you know, the, you know, the more time goes by and the more, you know, like kind of busy we get and fast food galore, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that's just what a, what a great accomplishment to humanity. Thank you for that. Oh, thanks. So, you know, it, it's something I, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, a sort of, uh, sort of themes throughout my career. And it, it feels like the thing that I'm really drawn to, I've realized I'm sort of a systems guy. And the, the projects and and themes of my career that uh, I feel like have really excited me are how can I create platforms for other people to be more creative or more powerful or to amplify their best selves. And so sort of Couch to 5K is sort of a platform for having people sort of reimagine their relationship to fitness or, you know, one of my early projects creating a content management system to make it easier for people to publish their creative thoughts to the web or even design systems. Now, a lot of the work that I do for the web, creating design systems to help people build their creative stuff faster than ever. So I don't know. I, I, I've realized that I'm sort of a platform guy. I would say so. And, uh, you know, you were contributing, you, you contributed to that, but uh, also so much more and especially what we're going to talk about today. And so I want to say officially, Josh, welcome to User Defenders. I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Oh my gosh. Thanks again. It's, I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> To have you back, I should say, yes. Uh, Josh was on episode nine, Defenders, and that was an amazing episode. It's uh, evergreen content. It's it's really good. So I recommend you check that out as well. Um, this is our so sequel. This is, this is our sequel it, episode. It, it, it is. And it's I think, summer. Uh, it's in, summertime. Uh, to, and to defy sequels. Hollywood, I think it, it could even be better than the first. We'll see, though. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not overpromise. Let's not overpromise. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is going to be uh, all about the state of UX in AI, and uh, I, I can't wait to dive in. There's so much. So let's let's just jump in here. Uh, Josh, are you familiar with the Turing test? Well, sure. Yeah, the the Turing test, the <laughs> sort of the, the the thing that was defined way back in the middle of the last century of of you know whether or not a uh, a machine can fool a human into thinking that it is a human being on the other side of the screen. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, it was developed by Alan Turing in 1950, and as you as you said perfectly, it's it was a test to see if humans could recognize whether it was a machine or not. Um, I learned about that uh, from the movie Ex Machina, which terrified me. By the way, um, we can we'll talk more about that I think as we go. But uh, Josh, my question for you to kick this off is: How do I know this is actually you, and, and not an, an artificially <laughs> intelligent clone you've concocted for this interview? Well, because if you had asked, uh, say, Alexa that question, I would have responded by saying, playing classic rock mix, because I would have completely misunderstood <laughs> your words and intention. Thank you. <laughs> so We're obviously let's, let's not quite getting there yet. I mean, I think that there is this idea that the machines are on the cusp of becoming these uh, these sort of perfect replacements for humans or, or these uh, these interfaces that are that we completely can't tell the difference from and yet I think that our day-to-day -day experience shows us completely otherwise that sort of Siri and Alexa front as being that but um, generally fail pretty miserably beyond really narrow tasks mm. yeah that's that is so true and, and we're gonna definitely dive more into why that is and maybe how it can be fixed if, if it can be. So I'm, I'm interested in that as well, but let's start from the basics. You know, the defenders listening, a lot of them are, 
uh, newer in, in this field. They're trying to navigate. And this is an area, as I disclosed to you, Josh, before our time, I'm, I'm a little nervous uh, more than, than, pos- than I uh, usually am about interviews uh, and it, because this is such an, um, a foreign kind of field. And it's, I mean, even though it's, it's certainly becoming the norm, there's, as you mentioned too, there's so much undiscovered and so much untapped potential. Um, and, and also some, as we'll get into as well, like some things to kind of maybe be a little bit afraid of, uh, in this. Um, but I, I want to kind of kick it off with, you know, let's just kind of start from the, the, the basics, you know, the, the, what is AI? What is machine learning? That's a great question. It's a big one, right? So uh, artificial intelligence is the general umbrella term for, you know, machines showing some kind of smarts or insight. Uh, and it's a really broad term and one that frankly has been sort of so infiltrated by science fiction expectations uh, and sort of pop culture expectations that it's it's not necessarily a particularly useful term anymore. But that's what it is. That's mm. the broad term. And I think it, it's helpful to break it into um, the, uh, uh, the, the categories of general AI and weak or narrow AI. I like narrow AI better than, than weak AI because even narrow AI can be quite powerful. But general AI is, I think, the the science fiction notion of artificial intelligence. This is um, uh, a machine that can reason and that can really think and shows real logic across a whole broad range of topics. This is a machine that you could have a conversation with. It's, it's HAL from 2001, right? Um, yeah. Narrow AI is uh, something that is really effective only on a really very specific domain of information or knowledge. Um, and that's really where we're at with almost with, with, with all of our AI right now is really narrow applications centered around machine learning uh, and deep learning is the is the particular technology uh, and flavor of machine learning that's made just a number of breakthroughs. It's it's sort of algorithms that then create their own data models upon data models upon data models and just go very deep at understanding a very specific problem. And it's really sort of a brute force approach to a problem. It, it finds patterns and then creates strategies based on the those patterns. So it's not something that is about logic uh, exactly, uh, so much as about pattern recognition at a level that human beings aren't able to do. AI as a field is 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 decades old, and it used to be more preoccupied with something that's called knowledge engineering. This idea that you could actually model human cognition to turn that into software, so that computers could learn to reason like a human expert to think, and that sort of ran uh, on the rocks um, in recent decades, and just sort of wasn't able to move very far forward until we just sort of got the processing power to just analyze huge amounts of data and extract patterns from them and make decisions based on those. Whew. Whew. Well said, my friend. Uh, we, <laughs> so that's, that is really good information. You mentioned algorithms in your response as well. And, and your fantastic mind the product talk, you said algorithms are the oxygen powering the next generation of emerging technologies. Now, how do, how do algorithms work? You can give us even wow, a high level. Yeah, sure. Um, well, and first, just to sort of say what I mean by that, uh, yes. by that sort of sentence that, that, that you quoted there, is, you know, when, when you look at all of the new interactions that are happening, things that are based on camera vision or computer vision, um, natural language uh, processing, speech recognition, uh, all of these things are based on this sort of narrow AI that I'm talking about, or this sort of pattern recognition and being able to extract patterns and understand what's happening there. So effectively, because of machine learning, the machines are able to understand all the messy stuff that we create that they weren't able to understand before, our handwriting and our speech and our photos and our doodles. Um, so that's sort of what I mean is it's, it's that kind of narrow machine learning is, is starting to, to, to power and enable 
this whole new set of promising interactions and models. And that includes, you know, things like virtual reality and augmented reality, all these things that need to be able to understand the world around us and impose information upon them or extract information from it. Uh, but what an algorithm is, is, you know, in algorithms are, are centuries old. This is stuff that, um, was, uh, uh, you know, Middle Eastern logicians and, and, uh, philosophers way back centuries ago, uh, co- you know, created the phrase uh, algorithm. And of course the Greeks turned it into that, but based on, uh, I believe the name of a logician, I've, whose whose name is lost to me. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting into Al the weeds Gore? here. Yes, it was Al, Al Gore. Gore. You got it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Al Gore rhythms? <laughs> He's been around for centuries. He's he made the internet, right? Yeah, Al Gore rhythms. Something that like sounds that. like some like just horrible <laughs> vanity album that he might have created. All he right. actually <laughs> did come up with something with that in the back in the early days of the internet. He was trying to. I forgot what it was, but he was trying to push something out there. And I was like, man, it's a little, little narcissistic to call and name it after yourself. But I mean, he can't help it. That's his name. That's it. That's right. It's an algorithm. <laughs> I think, uh, and I think our work here is done. That's it. That's okay. It. It's a good Thanks show. Thanks for listening, good everybody. <laughs> <laughs> See you on the next uh, one. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, an algorithm is really just, mm-hmm. it, it's like a, it, it's not all that different from a little, you know, computer program. It's a set of logical rules to arrive at a conclusion. So m- more practically, it's instructions for stepping through a set of computations or calculations of mathematical functions. And so in machine learning, those functions generally map to, again, mathematical models that are tuned to reflect patterns discovered in the world based on mountains of data. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's the kind of thing of like, I'm just going to show the machine a bajillion pictures of a dog or, or of dogs so that then it can recognize when dogs are in a picture. It will recognize that pattern. But because things are so narrow, again, these algorithms, in order for this, for it to be able to find the patterns, the patterns have to be really in a very specific domain. And so if you train the machine to see dogs, it will tend to see dogs in all kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's you, you sort of reinforce these patterns and then it will find those patterns everywhere, which is um, a strength in that very specific narrow domain. But it's, uh, it can be a little bit of a weakness when you try to broaden the domain. And, and you know, it, it can see its bias in all kinds of uh, different places. And so we have to be careful how we feed these machines data and be mindful of that their responses are based on the data that they're trained on. I was just thinking about something when you were answering that and you know, you're talking about math and dude, math is hard. Okay. Like (laughs) I'm a designer, like, and I'm a designer who knows HTML, CSS, and that's it. I haven't learned JavaScript. I've tried several times, probably not hard enough, but, um, you know, math is hard. And I, I, and I love the, the partnership between designers and developers. And of course, some of our greatest products have, have been created as a result. And I know you yourself have a, have a, uh, have, you know, a superhero force that you work with, with big medium, which is pretty awesome for projects on a project basis. But I was thinking about programmers, you know, and I've, I've been around programmers for 25 years or so now. And I understand how, well, I understand in a, a lot about how programmers think and, and I know they thrive around logic and certainty. You know, it's, it's either a one or a zero, right? It's, it's either, you know, a Boolean yes or a no, so to speak. But I was wondering, do you know, are developers going nuts working on this stuff? Because there's so much uncertainty, you know, you feed the machine, like you said, you feed the machine a bunch of pictures and then you search for a dog picture and then it pulls up blueberry muffins, you know, instead of a chihuahua, (laughs) you know, things like that. Like, is this, you think are developers going nuts around this stuff when it's so uncertain? You know, it's it's interesting. I think that the uh, the developers and the engineers who are designing these actually have a real respect for the range of gray that the machines see in the world, and that you know, which is natural, and that frankly we as human beings often see in the world and do our best to process. Uh, that you know, when you look at the output of a lot of these uh, sort of you know of, of the of these algorithms when they sort of give their results, you know, they often express their confidence in the result. 
Um, and, you know, and sometimes as designers, we surface that confidence in our uh, interfaces. You know, Netflix shows you a percent likelihood that this show is going to be for you, right? It's like 85% you're going to like this. And, you know, it's a, we use that as, as, uh, um, as viewers to understand, you know, how well likely this, this matches. We're sort of starting to bring that, uh, sort of absorb that machine confidence into our, uh, into our logic as just watching TV. Um, mm-hmm. and so the, the engineers, I, I think, cooperate with the machines in a sense to, to figure out how good the model is at predicting the thing. Um, mm. What I, I would say is actually as designers, I would say as designers, we're actually struggling a little bit with expressing <laughs> that. And part of mm. that, I think, is um, there's a certain enthusiasm about using this stuff. It's like the machine gave the answer. And frankly, there is a, a cultural bias toward rushing to give the the right answer. And, you know, we think about that a lot in terms of performance. And sometimes, you know, I I think there's been a really productive uh, push toward performance of, for example, web results, of making sure the page loads as quickly as possible. Um, And I think that that's great. That is part of a a great user experience. I think another part of the user experience is how can we give somebody their answer as quickly as possible? And, And you've seen, for example, Google in particular, really over the years pushing toward that, that it used to be if you searched for weather in New York, you would get a bunch of a list of web pages that could tell you what the weather in New York was. And then it sort of started to actually, on the top of the search results, it would just show you the weather in New York. And now in Google Chrome, if you start searching weather in New York, it will actually show you in the search box before you even do the search, right? They're, they're trying to minimize the amount of time to the answer. Um, and of course, that requires really strong confidence in the answer. But Mm. it's only valuable if the answer is correct, right? It's like rushing to the wrong answer does more damage than just taking a little bit of time. You know, it's better Mm. to say, I don't know, than to provide the wrong answer. And I think that we're seeing that. I think that's sort of the, the subtext, in a sense, of this cultural moment of the last couple of years as we've been grappling with the algorithm's uh, relationship to um, news and information and how that can be manipulated or provide information that reinforces our own individual bias without necessarily creating much enlightenment for, for people on either the right or the left. Uh, mm. and, and I think to come back to Google again, a, a great example of that, again, sort of the rush to give an answer, whether or not that's right or wrong, is um, uh, in those, uh, those uh, featured snippets that appear in the box at- above search results. You know what I'm talking about. If you're like, I'm searching for oh, yeah. how long to hard boil an egg, and it, and it, it, it gives me like the two-sentence snippet. So it's not just, here's the page that's likely to give you your answer. It's like, we think we've identified the two sentences on the internet that answer your question. It's, it's I feel lucky mm. on steroids, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, which is great, except for when it the you're in sort of a an area of controversy, you know. So if you ask a political question, it will tend to give you uh, an answer that may be correct and may not be, or may even be somewhat controversial. Especially this is especially true of areas that may have been gamed by hate speech, you know. So mm. for a, a, a long time, uh, if you uh, asked, and, and sometimes it will even suggest these answers, right? And Google suggest. So for until about a year ago, if you started typing in, are Jews, Google would suggest, are Jews evil? And then if, it w- if you chose that, it would just give you these search results or a featured snippet that would tell you exactly how that was the case. And I want to be super clear. Jews are not evil. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> right. that's not, a, that's not, a, but that's sort of like <laughs> the result of this thing. And, and it was even more yeah. sort of damaging is that those featured snippets are used to power answers for Google Assistant or Google Home. Because, you know, in a speech interface, you can't give a list of search results. So it's like, oh, here's a tidy answer to that thing. And so again, until about a year or so ago, if you asked, are women evil, Google Home, you know, it's like, okay, Google, are women evil? Mm. Google Home would say yes and give you like a 30 second explanation for exactly why. And again, I just want to be super clear, you guys, defenders, 
women are not evil. <laughs> that is not a good answer. <laughs> but that, I guess, so this comes back to the yeah. question of sort of like, uh, how do we think about binary answers? And I think that we have to recognize that they're a spectrum, uh, that there's a spectrum of rightness, you know, mm-hmm. and that in certain categories of things, how long do you hard boil an egg? What's the weather? We can have a pretty high confidence of that there's a right answer, but there's a whole mess of questions where there isn't necessarily a right answer. And in fact, there might be a lot of controversy and pain in rushing to a wrong answer. The algorithms mm. will say, I have a pretty good idea whether I'm right or not. And yet our the way we display these things suggests a confidence that I don't think the algorithms actually have. But I'm not sure that if you ask the algorithm, how confident are you that women are evil? They would not say 100%. You know, they would say, I found this information and it matches and I got a 59% confidence. (laughs) That's something that we as designers need to start creating a kind of a visual body language. Uh, You know, because it's not just sort of, I don't know. It's sort of like, I think maybe this is true or I don't know the answer or boy, this is a tricky topic. You know, it's like we have these (laughs) ways of expressing it in our own body language and and verbal language. How do we start to express that gray that the algorithms will report back? How do we express Mm -hmm. that in our interfaces as we show this? machine-generated information or data. Boy, I'm sorry, that was a really long ramble. Oh, that was great. That was great. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about, it's it's funny because the way that the machines are responding and at least how they were, I, I think it's changing. I think you are a big part of that conversation that's, you know, changing the way that, especially answers are displayed on the front end. Um, you know, like, it's okay to say, I don't know. I think that, you know, we just rely so much on machines to, to have the answer always. And, you know, we have the canon of the world's information in our pocket now, uh, which is pretty impressive. But um, I, I feel like the machines are doing with, with some of these responses, they're, they're doing everything that we're not supposed to do when we are practicing UX design. We're trying to design for users. We're not supposed to make assumptions, right? We're not, we're not supposed to do that. And we're, it's okay to say, I don't know. So I feel like yeah, that's that's an area of, of of change that's needed with with how these um, you know things are displayed on the front end for for users. And this is a perfect segue into my listener question. The first one. This is from James Mitchell. His handle on Twitter is at Mitchell James. Hi, Jason. Josh, I'm curious about the challenges in presenting errors to users within artificial intelligence, especially now it's becoming more ubiquitous than ever. It's sort of geared towards being present in the moment and and automatic in our lives. But then how do you address failure when people rely on it more and more? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. Thanks, James. Uh, And it's a hard one, you know, because I think one thing that we're sort of getting at here is as as you get to machine-generated content and machine-generated conclusions and machine-generated interactions where the machine is actually in charge of this, What it means for our craft is that we are moving away from effectively designing paths through information that is in our control. You know, that that essentially our job has been to nudge people and through pretty constrained paths of information to design for success. And I think what this area evolves where it's sort of like we don't exactly know what is going to be asked of the machines or how the machines might respond when we go into sort of this pure thing of like, great, give it any information, let it respond on its own. What it means is that we're really designing for uncertainty and designing for failure. So James's question is right on. How do we design for failure? And what I mean by that is the machines are weird. And so our job as designers is essentially to try to put our arms around this thing so that we can hopefully kind of corral and cushion the weird answers or at least give them context um, so that they don't do real damage. Um, and I think, so part of, the, part of the thing that we can do as designers is really having a really good sense of what the specific algorithm we're working on is, is good at and narrowing the scope of the application to fit what it's good at and to accurately report its results. And so again, you know, we come back to sort of that trivial 
example of of training uh, a machine to recognize dogs in the photos you know it's like this is something that is specifically about recognizing dogs you know and it's like it's not going to work on on other on other animals let's sort of make sure that we do that because otherwise we're going to be spotting dogs in all kinds of places that they don't actually exist um, but you know i think so coming to this uh, example again of how might we um, sort of let people know when they should or shouldn't trust the answer. It's not just, I don't know. It's also sort of reporting, you know, I think I know and, you know, but I'm not sure. And I, I think part of it is finding new ways to, um, really signal that it's time for the human being to engage their critical brain. And you, you sort of, we have this proxy, I think, and when we think about self-driving cars, it's like mm. there are contexts where the cars are, you know, in really pretty good shape, you know, like long straight highways, you know, sort of where, <laughs> where we've got pretty reliable, um, information on how the cars around us are going to be driving. Uh, you know, those are pretty good situations, but there are probably times when the driving situation becomes a little bit trickier for the car. And it's like, you know, this would be a good time to engage the human on this one. Uh, and I think that for <laughs> all kinds of, uh, uh, sort of fields of information, it's like, how can we, how, how might we signal a time that's sort of like, Hey, we actually could use a little human judgment here because the, the moment that an algorithm, fails or becomes uncertain is exactly the right time to engage human judgment. It's not all the machines all the time. It's got to be a partnership between humans and machines because machines are terrible at some things, just like humans are terrible at some things. And how do we sort of create and encourage that partnership instead of just handing over our brains completely to the machines because we do that all the time. And you, you read <laughs> yeah. about these things, right? About somebody who like just followed Google Maps driving to their 30 mile thing and somehow like wound up driving all over Europe and like 900 miles later. It's like, use your brain, you know? But we, we seed it and it's like, I do it all the time too. I just sort of seed this trust to the machine. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like we're using our um, system one thinking, as uh, Daniel Kahneman mentions in Thinking Fast and Slow. You know, he talks, he breaks the brain down into two systems. The first system is the lazy one. It's the uh, uh, automaticity. It's the automatic response. Somebody asks you your name, you don't even have to think about it, right? You somebody, and typically we do this in conversations uh, as well, for better or worse. Uh, that when somebody asks how you're doing, what do we automatically say? Good. Are we really doing good? Like, I mean, 90, maybe 50% of the time, maybe we're not doing good. You know what I mean? But it's, it's kind of like, you know, engaging that system one thinking. We just trust the machines maybe too much. And, and I think that's the, the kind of the, 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 the tightrope that we're walking here because we want to have trust. We want to have, you know, faith in these things, but they, they let us down often. So we, we're skeptics and we're, you know, so there's a lot of work to be done as, we're, as you're touching on, you know, and you mentioned the self-driving cars. There is an actual story. I know there's a lot more coming out, um, you know, the more these uh, become more prevalent in society, you know, unfortunately people getting, you know, killed, um, you know, and that, you know, that happens sadly, you know, when you're testing things. Uh, but I, there's an actual story where a, an older, an older fella was trapped in his self-driving car uh, because the car didn't know what to do in a roundabout. He got caught in a roundabout and the car went around. I'm not kidding you. This is an actual story. It went around for eight hours in that circle. And the guy finally got out, but he had to be admitted to the hospital for dehydration and probably, you know, you know, there's a lot of, you know, mental uh, issues as a result of that. So things like that are happening. And I think about, you know, like you talk about the balance between, um, you know, the humans and the machines is like, there's certain things that, you know, we still need to have an option for humans to control. And, and a perfect example of this that I've meant, I mentioned sometimes is, uh, on, uh, there's a, podcast called 99% Invisible, they did an episode called Children of the Magenta. And there's an actual story where, you know, they started doing a lot more automation and test piloting um, in, in aircrafts, especially for longer flights, of course, it makes sense. But there's the problem was, is that there wasn't enough training for when something went wrong. And unfortunately, in this case, something did go wrong. And the pilots, the, the, the pilots, the, they were co-pilots, the, the actual pilot had, was had a, a, like kind of a nice party weekend or something out 
in the Caribbean or whatever, and he was passed out. So the, the co-pilots didn't know what to do in that case. And, and sadly, the plane crashed and there was no um, override. There was no override uh, available or they didn't know how to access it. So there's a lot of, I think, uh, and this is a good kind of um, segue into our next area because I do like to talk about the FUD factor. I'm, I'm always, you know, the fear, uncertainty, doubt, um, because I, I mean, I, I, I think that we, we need to stay human no matter what, you know, and that's, I think that's the principle. I think you would agree with that, Josh. Like we, as much as we let machines take over, we still always need to, to practice humanity and civility and things like that. And so let's take a stroll down uncanny Valley, shall we? Um, <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Uncanny value, you know, it's for defenders listening is it basically means that the more human the machines become the weirder and the weirder and more off putting they can also become. Um, Josh, do you watch Silicon Valley? Do you watch that show? I watch it a little bit, but I, I, I <laughs> confess that it's a little too close and it just sort of seems it, it's, it's painful for me. So I don't watch a ton of it, I admit. Yeah, well, it's and I'll be honest with you, like it, it's getting, it's kind of like taking a turn. The writing is, I don't know, it's not as funny as it used to be, kind of things. But the last season, there, there was. This, I, I'm not uh, either, this, by the way. So it, it happens to all of us. I'm not as funny okay. as I used to be. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you remember the scene and so well. So there was a scene. You probably don't remember this, but it, it was a scene where there was a creepy programmer, and he made this AI, and it was a female, and it was really just like a torso, like you know her in, her her face, and then just her like her shoulders and stuff. And um, he was sexually violating that robot, and it came out in the episode. It was discovered, and she was almost like sending signals, like cries for help, like she was almost suffering from some sort of like synthetic. Pizza. TST. Um, it was really weird. It was creepy. And then I kind of, you know, I've been really interested in psychology lately. And, and, and I started wondering, like, is there an actual diagnosis um, of folks who kind of have weird attractions to machines? And sure enough, there is. It's called, mechanoloph- it's called mechanophilia. And it's uh, the love or sexual attraction to computers, cars, robots, or androids, washing machines, and other domestic appliances, even lawnmowers and other mechanized gardening equipment. And now I realize why somebody had to put a disclaimer on a chainsaw that said, do not use on your genitalia. Um, uh, weird. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> That's actually, there's, that actually exists. Um, so, and then I, of course, I thought of the movie Her, you know, and, you know, it's, there's kind of some of that in there. So all of that, all of that to say to my leading to my question is, you know, I can see us getting more and more attached to our machines and forgetting that they, they don't and will never have the capacity for genuine empathy. And I feel like it's hard, it's hard enough to lose a loved one who's a real human being in this life, you know, and thinking about mourning over the hard drive failure of a, a humanized machine feels a bit disturbing to me and, and frankly, psychologically dangerous. Do you have an, any opinions on this or am I the only weirdy who thinks about things like this? Uh, well, so uh, <laughs> first of all, I mean, I think that you are hitting on, you know, this sort of real trope in general of that, that we see in mythology throughout. And, and there's a, and, and there's sort of a misogynistic line to it. I, I shouldn't say sort of, there's definitely this misogynistic line of sort of storytelling mm. of how can man reinvent women, I- improve mm. women, you know? And so it's like in things like her, this is sort of part of it. Uh, and, and of course in that particular story, you know, uh, um, the operating system is sort of like becomes comes in a, for at least a little while his perfect woman but then of course sort of exceeds him but that's actually also yeah. part of the story always there's sort of this this you know going back to I don't know in the 80s weird science I don't know if you remember that one it's like two nerds <laughs> yes. you know sort of create their perfect woman as it sort of goes awry um, yep. ex machina is another example of that but it, it sort of all starts with this idea this desire to create a human and particularly to try to fix woman and uh, mm. it, it never really goes right and it's sort of rooted in this sort of problem of that some idea that there's something wrong with woman in general right uh, which you know I think part of this is this desire to to play God or to fix humanity in one way or another or at least to duplicate it in some improved way and I think that that's obviously sort of mythology and all these stories tell us that this is a a, a terrible and misguided idea 
Um, and I think that we probably even know that deep down. It sort of goes to some of the FUD that you're talking about. It's sort of like, is this really what we want? Sort of have like, do we want to replace humans with machines? And I, I would say that there is... Um, an inventor's fascination with the idea of can we do it? It goes to this to the Turing test thing that you sort of started with right at the beginning. Can we do it? Can we make a convincing replica of a human being? And you know, I don't know if that's ever going to be technically possible, um, but uh, I, but I doubt it. And I think in general, anyway, you know, let's instead of trying to make machines act like humans and be convincingly humans. Why not let the machines do what they do best and let people do what they do best? And what I mean by that is, you know, at the moment, what machine learning is really good at, again, this narrow AI, and perhaps this is something that could inform our, our general motion toward general AI, again, that sort of more intelligent artificial intelligence, is to recognize that the machines see the world in different ways and sort of logic in different ways than us. And in particular, for narrow machine learning, are great at, at, at taking on time-consuming or repetitive, detail-oriented, error-prone, or even, I would say, kind of joyless tasks, joyless from a human point of view, and really getting insights out of them. And it's like, that feels like that's a great place to start, is how can we take these jobs that people are not good at and require a lot of effort and generate a lot of error and let machines take care of that? In other words, they should not be a a replacement species for human beings, but should be a kind of a companion species. How can we work together in interesting ways? And I think that so much of the conversation around artificial intelligence and, and machine learning tools is how can we replace people? And I think really a much more interesting thing is how can we amplify what people do best? And I guess that again sort of goes back to this platform mm. notion that I think about is I, I like to think about systems that let us be our best selves. Um, mm. rather than diminish us. And I think, you know, if you look at what a lot of technology is about right now in terms of sort of popular um, services coming out of Silicon Valley, it's often these convenient services that I would sort of argue, let us be lazier or let us be less or let us just sort of have more leisure time, which I don't diminish. Leisure time is great and, and in many ways does help us be our better selves and more rested and more creative. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it's the kind of thing of like, how can we actually create systems that help us be more of what we are, do more, ha reach the goals that we want to have rather than sort of just let us just sort of take over things for us. I like that a lot, Josh. It's, that's, I think one of the core principles to this entire talk right there is how do we do that? How do we, you know, create systems, like you said, that amplify what people do the best. And, you know, and, and I, I do have a question coming about that, but I want to continue down this path a little bit more about voice UI. Um, you know, and, the, and we mentioned the movie Her, you know, that, that voice UI is prominently featured as a, pretty much a way of life in, in the not too distant future. It already kind of is now in a way. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously voice UI is, you know, it's flawed. I mean, you know, there, and we have po many popular systems. we got Siri, Alexa, Cortana, Google Assistant, probably more coming. You know, there's, I mean, there's just a lot of frustrating flaws to this experience still. However, you know, like ver the varying dialects can be a challenge, uh, you know, volume levels of our voices, you know, Bluetooth device handoffs. Like when I use my, when I try to use Siri in my truck to even like record a memo or something, I have to turn my, my, um, Bluetooth off because my car speaker doesn't work well enough. I mean, that's, that's probably a whole nother challenge, but there's just a lot of different inherent challenges to using this. And then overlaps even, you know, like we are, you know, we say, Hey, Siri, Hey, X, you know, whatever assistant name, you know, if we're all doing that on a subway, I mean, there's just a lot of overlap. I just feel like there's a, still a lot of UX challenges with, with this, uh, technology. Um, you know, are, do you feel like, and by the way, when I, when I get to heaven, I feel like God's going to tell me how many hours of my life I wasted trying to get Siri to do things that I ended up having to do myself, you know? <laughs> so I mean, do, is there hope for these virtual assistants? You know, if so, what is it, or is it better way coming? What are your well, you know, I think you're touching on a on a whole bunch of different things, uh, which are all super interesting. And, and I think it's worth saying it's um, 
you know, there's nothing more frustrating than talking to a system whose entire purpose is to understand your speech and have it not understand you. And that, you know, if it doesn't understand you the first time, then you've, it was probably not worth asking it in the first place, right? Because it's like now you're repeating it a second and a third time and it's just, (laughs) and it's not clear that the result is going to be any better. So it's actually taking away time from you, right? So that's a really frustrating experience. And so there's a whole bunch of different parts of this. And one is just that notion of, does it understand me? And even there, there's sort of, there's sort of two, um, two kind of, uh, uh, levels of understanding. One is the simple speech recognition. Um, it, so in our house, we, we have an echo, we have, uh, you know, an Alexa device and, um, uh, well, you know, my wife, Liza Kindred, she was on the show oh, yeah. uh, a, a little while ago. And so yeah, mindful uh, technology. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, as a mindful technologist, I can say that Liza does not at all like Alexa and specifically the Echo device. So <laughs> uh, it understands our, our daughter, our 18-year-old daughter, Veronica, and me, I would say 90% of the time, which is pretty good, right? That's it's yeah, maybe about as much bad. time as, as much as another human understands us, it turns out, actually, uh, <laughs> which is pretty good. But it understands yeah. Liza never. And so, you know, <laughs> it's like, I, I'd set up a few things, you know, we could turn on our lights with, with it. And, you know, she'll come in and she'll say, you know, Alexa, turn on the lamps. And Alexa will say, playing Christian children's music. You know, it's just, <laughs> and, it, and I'll, you know, so I'll try to help. And I'll be like, Alexa, turn on the lamps. And then it'll do it. And she's like, oh, <laughs> your girlfriend does it for you. And like, you know, in joke, but it's also sort of annoying. And so now it, it became awkward. <sighs> For Veronica or I to speak to Alexa in front of Liza, like it's sort of this unwanted mm. person in our house. So it feels exclusive. A, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so and so it's wow. this, and so it, there's a thing that is there's a personal nature to this that creeps in that uh, you know that we know better, but it felt like. Alexa didn't like Liza and Liza certainly didn't like Alexa. <laughs> and so and it's sort of like, but it's just a machine. It's just a, an algorithm that's running this, but it has this by just the nature of presenting as a voice has this powerful, um, you know, personalizing aspect to it that has this emotional aspect that does get at your earlier question about sort of our emotional relationship to these machines. But even mm-hmm. beyond understanding the voice, there's understanding intention, understanding what does the question mean. So often, even when they get the, the, the voice recognition exactly right, understanding the intention uh, doesn't, always, doesn't always work, right? And, so that, and I think that's sort of what you're getting at too. It's like, you know, just sort of this, I don't know the answer to that. I have no idea what to do with mm-hmm. that, with those words. Um, mm-hmm. is, a frustrating, is a frustrating thing that happens all the time. Part of the thing too is specifically like with Alexa, you have to know the incantation, right? Like you have to know exactly how to phrase the thing uh, or to remember what it knows because it's not, it, I think one of the problems with these voice assistants is they sort of front as general AI, ask me anything. I can, I can help you with anything, but it turns out, of course, they can't. They've got, you know, uh, still a relatively, while it's broadening every day, it is still in the grand scheme of things, a relatively narrow set of abilities. Uh, and yet, because they're in the thousands of things that we can ask them, not the millions or bajillions or anything that we could ask humans, but they're just in this still impressive but narrow band of a few thousand things. That's still a lot more than I can remember what I'm allowed to ask Alexa for. And also Mm -hmm. uh, the specific way that I have to ask Alexa or have to ask Siri. If, you know, it's like, if I want to add a reminder to a specific to-do list in my things app on my phone, I have to ask Siri in a really specific way that I can never remember. And so there's a, uh, Benedict Evans, speaking of the uncanny valley, has the uncanny valley of speech assistants, which is that as they become more and more capable, they actually become harder to use because now it's on me to remember how to use them. And so when they have three or four skills, I can remember that, I can do that. But as they sort of present as more and more human, but not quite, then I, Basically, between 
when they have like five skills and when they have all the skills, infinite skills, there's that whole gap in between where it's just like, man, I don't know. And which is why everyone basically asks Alexa to set a timer and play music. And that's about it <laughs> because they can't remember yeah. the commands. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So there's still room for innovation around this, of course. Um, like for example, like I'll ask her to add something to, cost, to my Costco list, but I have to, I can't say, I can't just say Costco like we do because there's somebody in my address book whose last name is Costco. So I That's have tough to for like, an, say, a lot of reasons, I'm sure. Yeah. I have to, I've, I've, you know, Siri has trained me to say, to actually really pronounce, enunciate that T in Costco. That's the only way, uh, you know, and, and then it gets right about 90% of the time when I do that. But it's, you know, there's just those, a lot of little things and that's a small little detail, but yet something that has to be addressed by, by the engineers involved. Well, and that's a hard thing. The more that we talk to robots, the more that we talk like robots and, and, you know, that's, right. uh, that's not the outcome that we want. I mean, you know, I think there's always these sort of periods of transition, uh, but, you know, obviously we want technology that bends to our lives instead of the reverse. And I think that yes. so often, especially as it's sort of like we have this well-intentioned thing of like, great, we've got the machines that can understand our speech. And yet we have to talk to them in sort of this weird stilted speech or in very specifically structured commands. Now, this is the early days. You, you look back at where we were a decade ago, and this seems, uh, this is all amazing. You know, this is all like the world of science fiction. So part of the the challenge is, is that uh, technical advance inflates expectations faster than it fulfills them. Uh, and so often as technologists and as consumers, we see the glimmer of possibility here. We can imagine how Siri or Alexa could be super useful if they would just understand us and anticipate what we wanted better. Uh, but they aren't there yet. And, you know, they're making leaps and bounds in speech recognition and sort of in, in natural language processing to map that speech to actual intents. Um, but it's, it's coming sort of maybe more slowly than we would like. Uh, and then, you know, gradually it will happen over sort of the tasks that we want and we'll just they'll just fold into our lives. I do think that um, speech is a very convenient interface for a lot of different contexts. Uh, and I think often people imagine it's sort of like, well, I can't do everything with speech, and that's okay uh, if you don't. That you know, I think that the idea that that our future is going to hold a variety of different interactions and interfaces, just as they always have before machines even came into it, in the way that we will write or gesture or speak uh, or you know use imagery. Uh, it, for a whole bunch of different contexts between people, I think that that will evolve with machines too. That you know, will will adapt to the right channel and the right mode of conversation as the machines get better at at doing that. Yeah, and you know what? I was thinking too. I kind of left out of my what I was saying about the different kinds of of things that that happen. Um, you know, with dialects and volumes, and I kind of left off uh, hearing impaired folks, deaf people. They can't really use Alexa, right? They can't. I mean, a lot of them can't talk clearly uh, because of the hearing impairment, and so that's a challenge too. But here's a, and I want to kind of shine a little sunshine on this on this just this part of it because I just yesterday saw an article or tweet uh, by Fast Company Design that they there some an app developer created an app that allows Alexa to actually communicate with deaf people. It's really cool. It's impressive. I'll be sure to link to it in the show notes, Defenders. But it uses the camera, and it actually understands sign language. And in, and in the way it communicates back to the hearing impaired person is uh, through um, some really large uh, subtitles. So it, like things like that. Like I love innovations around that. You know, where we just try to you know make an experience that works for everybody as much as possible. So that was a, a nice little bit of sunshine. But I want to say, my hearing impaired friends, please don't use this while driving. <laughs> there you go. But, you know, it, it, and you're totally right about that. But also what a boon for the blind, these sort of speech and audio 
interfaces that mm, rather than right. sort of having to hack these visual interfaces with mm. screen readers that have mixed results based on how yep. the software or web page is built that you know here's something that's actually designed for that and i think that as we get more and more options and ways to get in it in, into information and and of course you know these voice assistants also work with text as well that you can you can have these sort of text based interfaces that the the natural language processing just works on the writing instead of on the speech but as we have all these different uh, options that we can people will be able to adapt to their specific needs or context whether those are uh, related to their their abilities or their physical context of what they're doing at the moment if they're driving when we're driving we are all essentially uh, blind because our eyes are occupied you know and our hands are occupied so mm. that's that's a good place for a speech yeah. interface for all Fully agree. Yeah, I've, I've been grateful for having the ability to do that, and you know, even having an Apple Watch. Like I, you know, I try to remember to to put it on, you know, raised to wake before I actually start driving, and that way I don't even have to keep take my eyes off the road and really don't have to move my hand that much. And so that's been like things like that have been really neat. I think that's that's where we kind of want to remain is where technology is a servant and not a master. And I feel like you know when computers first came out on the scene early, you know, on in the seventies and then the 80s and then when software started happening it was like the promise was to humans we want to be your assistants we want to serve you right and now it's, I feel like you know 30 years later I feel like it's kind of become reverse like we're kind of serving the machines a lot more you know I, it feels like you know especially with a lot of the addictive apps and such and you know and your you know your lovely wife Liza Kindred is an expert on that stuff and defenders listen and listen to uh, mindful tech episode user defenders.com slash mindful tech um, where where we talk a little bit more about that. And, uh, but I, I feel like we've, we've kind of come to this place where we've become more of the servants, uh, to the technology. And, and that kind of brings me into, uh, one more question in the FUD section. Um, it, one day it, there's this quote from, uh, Nathan in the movie Ex Machina. He play, he's played by Oscar Isaac and he's kind of the genius that created the, these AIs. Um, and, and he says something really caught my attention when I was watching and I had to, I had to actually write this down. He said, one day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossil skeletons. <laughs> That kind of scared me a little bit. And then I thought about, you know, how Hollywood, you know, I know it's just movies or stories, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that Hollywood has kind of predicted. Like, I mean, even Minority Report, we're still, people are still trying to create that, you know, after all these years, it's been at least two decades, you know? So I, I feel like there's, there's a lot, there's sometimes things to be said, like Hollywood's pretty good at capturing kind of the imaginations and where humanity is at with, you know, morality and things like that. Um, so I, Westworld iRobot, Terminator, Black Mirror, Ex Machina, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, Hollywood, there's no shortage of productions that kind of depict the machines we built will one day rise up and take over and possibly destroy us. You know, in your Adobe XD interview, which Adobe's actually sponsoring this episode, thanks Adobe, um, you address these common fears that, that many of us have about AI. You said basically um, all of this stuff is, you know, said, quote, it's, quote, still a long ways off, end quote. You know, do you believe this will eventually and inev inevitably become a threat to us? Like that the machines we've made will eventually overtake and possibly destroy us? I, you know, I think that it is possible. I mean, the... And I guess I want to sort of say when when I say that this is a long way off, I'm really talking about general AI as an idea of the sort of like the the conscious, sentient machine, uh, sort of mm. the singularity stuff that uh, that you hear hear about as sort of the with the machines become Terminator and you know all the all the good all the good science fiction nitty gritty comes true. Uh, Ed two hundred nine. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think <laughs> I, I think science fiction is powerful, you know, and I think that we often that it, it creates the models and expectations for what we ought to create or what we ought not to create. And so, you know, I mean, I think that the you know, the Star Trek communicator, you know, the, the flip phone, essentially, you know, it, it sort of made that, you know, that, that the Captain Kirk's communicator basically made it inevitable that we would have a clamshell phone. You know, so I think the stories that we tell about the future have a, a certain um, quality of, of defining what the future will be. So, and it, which also makes those stories important. I think that we are in a phase of sort of dystopian uh, storytelling 
um, mm. in a way to counter a little bit of the exuberant optimism that comes out of Silicon Valley as sort of this very sort of willful optimism about the power of technology. And yet we also feel its effects going a little bit sideways. And I think that that's really come to the fore in the last uh, year or so with some of, um, in particular, Facebook's foibles and and missteps mm. and um, kind of in, in their use of, of data. Uh, so, you know, I think that part of that is a corrective um, that is necessary and useful. And I think also this, again, you know, we have just so many centuries of myths of the risks of trying to create our own human being. You know, it's like Mary Shelley, you know, with Frankenstein, you know, it's all this stuff. It's like, don't try to play God, right? That's, that's sort of like the story. So I think that that's like a constant yeah. theme about humanity in general. It's sort of like, you know, let's understand our place in the natural order and not try to overstep it. So I think part of mm. those stories are, are that, and I think we should recognize them as that. And, and, you know, I think, reminding ourselves as creators of some useful humility there is is important. I will say, you know, I think that artificial intelligence broadly and even the narrow uh, the narrow intelligence, the narrow AI that we're experiencing right now has incredible power to help us uh, as well as to hurt us. Um, mm. And I think it, I think even the stuff that is not necessarily clear. And I think that sometimes it's going to surprise us when it helps us or hurt us. There's a, a historian of technology named Melvin Kranzberg, and he has his six laws of technology. And Kranzberg's first law is that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And and what that means is it's sort of like mm. the good or the bad that we intend to do with technology depends on, again, our, our intention, how we how we use it, how we deploy it. Uh, but the nor is it neutral means that we may not understand its effects until we put it out there. And I mean, I think that that's been a little bit of Silicon Valley's experience. It's sort of like what I will go ahead and believe is good intention about actually making the world a better place, which I think is sort of so much a, a refrain of the technologists uh, there is, uh, you know, I think to take that at face value, I think that a lot of the stuff that we've created, you know, hasn't turned out that great. And I, you know, I, I feel that even in my own experiences as, as focusing on mobile software for a long time, that's sort of a, an assumption that, Hey, this is an opportunity to fill empty moments, um, with, you know, productivity or, or play or something, you know, as I feel culpable in some of the theft of attention that's, that's happened in the last decade uh, in terms of my work there. So, you know, th that's all to say, it's like, we don't necessarily know how this is going to turn out. We have a really powerful uh, new technology in machine learning of something that can find patterns, give insights, make decisions on our behalf, or at least recommendations or suggestions, surface information. Um, and in some ways could take agency from us. Uh, you know, whether or not it actually becomes a sentient being that takes over the world, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I do think that we're already giving these systems agency and important um, civic areas of our life from prison sentencing to granting loans to determining prices for health insurance uh, to hiring and promotion that, um, you know, I think that we should really be careful about how those machines make decisions because they have our own human biases cooked into them. They all have values. All mm. software has values. All software is political. It's, it's, it's mm. built with the values of the, of the things that we put into it intentionally or unintentionally. And so I think that at least in the short to medium term, the opportunities and the risks are around how we apply those systems and being really clear and explicit about the biases that we're putting into those systems. Design and build interactive prototypes, update artwork, and test your experiences all without having to upload, sync, or jump back and forth between apps. Adobe XD is available for both Mac and PC and integrates with Adobe Creative Cloud libraries, meaning that no matter what your team configuration, XD has you covered. And now you can get Adobe XD for free. Just go to userdefenders.com slash XD to learn more.
Mm. Very well said, Josh. Yeah, I think that, you know, before we switch gears here into the how, I I, I feel like yeah, before we switch gears here, I want to touch on kind of what you just mentioned about you know, the output of these things. And I think largely it's, it, you know, the output equals, you know, input really. Um, and you said it in your talk too, on the mind of product, you said garbage in, garbage out um, into these things. And, and the thing that I think scares me the most about this is that, and we've already seen it a lot in Silicon Valley, that oftentimes money will actually have a best interest over humanity. And I think that's what scares me the most because, you know, and we've seen like some brilliant, brilliant uh, hackers do things that you know, are just unthinkable and, and unimaginable, you know, and, and you just go, wow, you could use that for good. You could use those superpowers and do some really good things with it. But I feel like, you know, there's, there's this, that inher inherent nature within us. It's sometimes there's that greed. You know, we saw it with Facebook, with the data cells and, you know, and the privacy invasions. And, you know, I just, I think that's what scares me the most about AI is it's, it depends on who's programming it. It depends on who's developing it and depends on what their motives are. So that scares me. That's the last thing I wanted to say about that. I, I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. And, and you know, so, you know, I think we, we look at some of the things now, technologies that have been sort of used specifically around like CGI for, for decades in, in Hollywood to create remarkable special effects, you know, sort of the proliferation of machine learning and computer vision and generative uh, software, um, generative that can create its own imagery and own video uh, has opened up the sort of essentially made that technology available to, to the public or at least sort of the, the, the semi-skilled public here when it comes to having some familiarity with with how to put these models to use. And so you have things like uh, deep fake going out there, which which puts the faces of celebrity women onto um, onto into pornographic film scenes. Mm. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to be super clear about that. You know, this is an assault on those women. You know, this is like yes. this is a this is really a, a awful thing to to do to somebody to effectively impose your identity on on somebody else, and particularly to do it in sort of that specific scenario. Uh, and so here's this technology that we've been using in these really sort of benign ways for for entertainment effectively, but it has evolved into a way that it can be used for assault. Um, you know, so I, I think you're right. It's sort of like, how is this stuff going to be used? And also, how can we learn as sort of just as, as citizens in this world as, uh, and, and as defenders, uh, how yes. can we start to protect against those kinds of manipulations where we can no longer trust our senses because the manipulation has become so good that now we can make, um, video of any public figure to make them say anything that we want. Here's the evidence. You know, we can no longer trust our senses. In some ways, that yeah. can be also be used to good. So there's um, more and more we're getting this effectively kind of human, uh, like hearing aids for everybody, basically. That if you mm -hmm. think about the earbuds that you've got, but they have little computers in them, things that can be used to do live translation. That's something that uh, Google's Pixel Buds introduced about a year ago is, you know, it's like somebody says something in one language, you get the translation is what you hear in your ears, uh, you know, Star Trek's universal translator uh, in action or this thing of sort of like I'm at a concert, but I want to actually adjust the concert to my own specific needs that I can, you know, again, it's using sort of machine learning algorithms to process the sound that's coming in and change it. So I can change the bass, change the treble, change the volume. I can focus more on the person who is speaking right in front of me or or tune them out if that's you know if that's what I'm doing or you know eavesdrop on the people behind me but the point is that that personal hearing experience is now completely subjective to me I'm no longer hearing the same thing that you are and when you sort of think about that as sort of the you know, sort of this proxy of, you know, one of the problems that we have in our culture right now is I no longer perceive the world the way that others do, that I have this information bubble. Um, how does that get reinforced even more when now the things that I see or hear are manipulated either with good intention or bad? You know, it's a, it's a strange world. So how do we 
create, I don't know, what's the, what's the browser tab thing to sort of let me know that this image was generated by artificial intelligence? You know, are these the kinds of things that we need? Can those be created to sort of help us navigate a very strange world that's going to come? All very, very provocative questions and important questions to ask actually too. So, so I want to switch gears here, Josh, as we kind of start to kind of wrap this up. Uh, I've, I've certainly got some more questions, but I want to kind of start talking about kind of how this is done, because I know a lot of the defenders listening are, you know, are very interested and very uh, excited about what's possible. And, and, and I know that my, the defenders listening there, they want to do good. They want to make a difference and they want to make things better for people, for their users. And so that's what excites me. And that's what, one of the things that makes me feel good about doing this is, you know, being able to influence those folks, you know, so I want to talk about kind of you know, how, how these things are done. But, but first of all, I want to talk about our, our jobs because, you know, we've seen, we've kind of seen a lot of the writing on the wall. We've, you know, as web designers, even we've seen, you know, software come out that just says, Hey, you don't need to know how to do anything. You don't need to hire a professional designer. You know, we have a, a machine that'll just spit out a custom website for you, you know, things like that. And that's, that's actually been around for a little while now. Um, so that's kind of one thing that, you know, I feel, especially for like freelancers, you know, like that maybe don't have a, a, a good or loyal customer base. They, they have, I, I think a bit of a reason to be concerned about that. Um, you know, what about, I know there's certainly a lot of other things coming too, but should we, we should we be worried about our jobs? I mean, futurist, uh, the futurist author, Kevin Kelly says that we shouldn't worry since, uh, even though many normal jobs that we know today will be extinct due to artificial intelligence, there will be a host of new jobs for us to do. You know, my concern is nobody knows exactly what those jobs will be. Uh, and he doesn't specify it either. Uh, where do you stand with these notions? You know, do you have uh, an idea or opinion of what these jobs, quote unquote, might look like? Well, you know, I think that the history of technology is one where we see that vulnerable jobs often can be replaced by technology, that if the machine can do the job, that that will probably get absorbed into that. It, it will probably get absorbed by the machine. Uh, and, you know, that goes back to, you know, as soon as we've been sort of started to build tools and simple machines. Um, I think that as we think about it in terms of our jobs, the kind of work that we do, I think the kind of jobs that are vulnerable are the ones where it's sort of like there are kind of clearly settled solutions. You know, so so to go back to this idea of, of um, you know, perhaps web designers will lose work to uh, services that can create a website instead. You know, I, in a sense, that has happened already just by the virtue of having templates. You know, it's like, you yeah. know what, creating that photo portfolio website, that's a solved problem. We know how to do it. You know, so yeah. perhaps that's not really the thinking that we, perhaps we don't need a lot of jobs for that particular thing because we actually have that solved problem. And if you think of a designer's role as solving problems, well, that's not really a fertile area anymore anyway. And so, you know, mm. I think that the, the kinds of things that the machines will be good at, and let me sort of pull back. I think sure. to understand what machine learning is good at, it's useful to understand that really it's good at dis- deciding what's normal that you point it in a direction, it finds the patterns, it figures out sort of a range of normal for that thing, and it predicts the next normal thing. Or it uh, understands aberrations with things. It's like, oh, these people are healthy, this person is tracking in a weird way, something could be wrong, they could be unhealthy. Uh, And so when you think about that in terms of our own work, it's really sort of like finding patterns of just the way stuff is done. Um, so it's the kind of thing that perhaps over time it could construct, uh, you know, you could have these systems that could construct sort of the ideal e-commerce experience based on traffic and effectively machines doing their own little A-B testing, or at least the scaffolding for it. But I think that that's a good way to think of it, is that I think that the machines, at least in the in the near term, are going to be good at, at being assistance for creating scaffolding for kind of low-level production work. Um, Airbnb has done some interesting experiments with this, where essentially they uh, gave uh, uh, a machine model 
sketches of different elements from their design system, essentially visual symbols for each element in their design system so that then the system could read those symbols and basically pluck those design patterns out of their code and construct a web page. Uh, so if, effectively, you could take a, a whiteboard drawing and suddenly have a web page from it. You know, that's not going to be the perfect web page, but it does get you started. Um, it, 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 it sort of short circuits the need for having a, it replaces having sort of a, a high fidelity uh, wireframe sketch with sort of moving directly into the browser in a place where you might be able to have a direct conversation between designer and developer about what to do next. That's sort of like it moves the production along. Uh, in fact, there's a, a really interesting service uh, called, man, I don't know how you say it. It's like UIZARD, or maybe it's supposed to be Weezard, but U-I-Z-A-R-D. Uh, hmm. And it, it does sort of a similar thing. Is it takes sketches and creates uh, sketch files for you, or actual like um, a working iOS uh, app, you know, basically mapping symbols to, um, to UI elements. And, you know, I, I think we're also starting to see uh, artificial intelligence sort of being used to sort of identify um, how to crop an image, you know, what's a good crop, uh, rather than just sort of being like crop from the center or crop from the corner. It sort of can understand what the focus of the image is and crop to that. And, you know, so there's sort of these jobs that are, again, kind of low level production work that we often do, but that I think fall into that category of tasks that I mentioned earlier um, that machines are good at. Things like that are time consuming and repetitive mm. and detail oriented and error prone and kind of joyless. I think the machines mm. can be good companions to that. Um, so uh, that's a that's a long answer. I, you know, I don't know that. I, I do think that there are what we might consider some some junior um, level production tasks that are going to be vulnerable to this next generation of of AI uh, design mm-hmm. tools or machine learning driven design tools. Um, but you know, I think that hopefully what that does is it frees us up to solve new solve new problems instead of com- con- continuing to repeat settled solutions. I like that answer, Josh. Um, uh, do you think that digital designers who don't get behind designing for AI and machine learning will eventually be left behind? You know, I, I, I feel like this is a little bit like the early days of mobile, where it's sort of like, man, this is, seems like it's... A, and, and when I say that, I mean um, maybe before the iPhone came out. Uh, where it was sort of like, yeah, there's something here. This really feels like it's a thing. We've all got these phones. They are kind of computery. There seems like there's going to be something here. We got to figure out how to design for these. Uh, and then when the iPhone came out and it became really popular and Android followed soon after and it was just everywhere. And suddenly there was like this boom was like, Oh, holy cats, we got to get on this. <laughs> like this was really clear that it was there. This feels like this is something that is brewing to me. I think that right now uh, machine learning is sort of broadly available to, not to all, it is not yet broadly available to all organizations, but I think that that's going to change pretty soon. And I think that once we sort of get some thinking into how do we use this in the right way, and I think this is something we should talk about this, is how can... um, designers and UX designers and researchers play this role in understanding this is where can we deploy machine learning that as we get that going I think again this is the, the I, I really believe that this is the oxygen of that's powering all of the interesting stuff that's coming in the next generation of technology so just as mobile defined the last 10 years of our industry I really think that machine learning is set to define the next so it is time to get started in figuring out what design's role generally is in this and what designers' roles individually are in this. But it's early. It's not panic time. But it's it's time to start thinking okay. about it because this is going to be part of our job. Very cool. That's, that is... Uh, encouraging and a bit alarming, but in a good way. So defenders, you know, yeah, this listen to uh, what Josh is saying, and you know, and I, I know we're going to provide you know even more context here, and maybe some areas where you can go kind of dive in a little more. Uh, is there a specific area of study or focus you believe would benefit those defenders wanting to dive into designing for AI the most? Well, there are two things. I think one 
is I think there is sort of some some technical um, uh, sort of familiarity that you can get with sort of what these systems are good at and what they're not. But I think the second area is also really applying the skills that we've already got as designers and UX experts and researchers to this new problem. Uh, but to talk about the first, I think that it's useful to get to know sort of broadly, you know, what it is, how how machine learning works, the different types of models. You don't have to like learn the math behind them, but I think it's useful to understand what they're good at and what they're bad at. So in the same way that if you're a web, if you are a a visual or UX designer for the web, it's useful to understand how to work with the grain of the web, what it's good at, what's, what it, and what it's bad at, what's hard to render as an interface and what's easy to render as an interface that you can design with that. I think that's a good thing to understand with the sort of the different flavors of, of machine learning. So, um, there are a lot of intro courses uh, that are sort of intended to teach uh, how to make machine learning work and the different models that are out there. And I, I think that that's useful to kind of get a, a big picture for for how this stuff works, again, what it's good at and what it's bad at. Uh, it, more than that, too, I think that um, if there are algorithms that your organization is working with or starting to play with, getting a little bit of hands-on time with them is is helpful to, again, understand the kind of results they give, how they report their confidence and whether or not the result is correct. Is this a useful hint or suggestion or is this a firm answer? Um, you know, I, I think a good example of this, um, and this is an easy place to get started, is all the big... Um, sort of technology companies, when you look at Microsoft or Google or Amazon or IBM, they all are not only in sort of a race to come up with the best machine learning algorithms for speech recognition and natural language processing and computer vision or compu- or, um, or camera vision. Uh, they also share those algorithms because they want you to use them. They want your data to sort of make those things even better. And so basically, if you use any of their hosting services, um, if you use Microsoft Azure for your for your hosting, you get their machine learning APIs for free, and they're pretty easy to play with. Um, in fact, machine Microsoft has you know on their uh, cognitive services API. That's what they call them. Their cognitive services um, on their cognitive services API page, you can sort of link into any of them. They have an easy web interface that you can upload images and see the data that comes back and how confident it is in recognizing the things that are in that image and just playing with those things. You get a real sense of it's sort of like, oh, this is the kind of way that I might expect information to come back. This this tells me how I can structure an, an, an interface that is honest about how uh, confident the answer is, for example. So I think that just actually just getting your feet wet and sort of playing with these things directly is really important. Splash in puddles a little bit, play and, and maybe even make some ridiculous applications with these things that are these services that Microsoft and IBM and Amazon and Google provide are pretty easy to work with from a from a web development standpoint. You know, I think that you get a, a web developer to work with. You guys, you you know, the the two of you could could make something um, kind of interesting and fun. Sort of play with that. But I, like I think that, that I, I just think it's really I, I think that the tools are out there for us to sort of start. You know, I don't know that you build products on these, but it's a useful sandbox to start to play in and and get familiar with. But the second piece uh, that I mentioned earlier is how do we use our skills that we are really great at to to solve new problems using machine learning? Because I think so far it's been a domain that's been dominated by um, data scientists and algorithm engineers, and rightly so. They've been sort of figuring out how, what can we do with amounts with these huge amounts of data to extract insights and make predictions and and identify patterns. Um, and they've shown us what's possible. But, you know, and I think that for a long time, design has sort of been outside of this. And there's been maybe some head scratching of, well, so what is my role? I don't know how to write an algorithm. Uh, I think that there are a few different things to think about. One is that creating a brand new machine learning model takes a lot of effort and a lot of data and a lot of expense as a result. And so it's really important to, and because these are very narrow applications right now, it's really important to understand where to apply that problem. And so if you Mm. look at sort of like, you know, what do we do? What are the tasks that happen in a specific context? You know, you're a radiologist and your job is to identify some 
science of cancer. You know, what's, you know, you're not going to create a system that is expert on cancer broadly. What, what, where can the machine step in? And again, thinking about those areas as sort of time consuming, repetitive, detail oriented, error prone, joyless tasks. Where can the machine step into that? You know, how can they help to analyze all these mountains of images to, again, amplify the real talents of the radiologists, which are not just sort of looking at image after image after image? You know, it's like, how can they actually bring to the fore the, the real skill of the radiologist there? And so I think part of it is really understanding the problem to be solved understanding where machines can be helpful. And this is really, you know, contextual inquiry. This is research uh, that you're doing here to really understand the task and the workflow involved in it. And then to understand, you know, where is the data that would help to solve the problem at hand? Who holds that data? What is the audience for that information? how can we make sure that we are getting an audience of people or of training data that is really reflective of the world that we're trying to influence or create? And these are all research questions. This is good UX stuff here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like how, you know, these are the things. And then once we have the information, how do we present it in a way that is honest to the, the, the actual confidence of the algorithm. You know, how do we express that? I'm positive, I'm not sure, or maybe this is a hint, this is a suggestion, or, or just calling out that this needs some, some attention or some human eyeballs. Um, so all these things, I think, are, are ways to think about, basically, there's a new tool that you can use, this new powerful technology for detecting patterns. Where in the process should we use it? And what might that look like? How would that change people's lives? This is sort of a, a, a design concept question. I think those are the areas where we badly need some help. Mm, so good, Josh. Uh, I was thinking when you were answering that, I thought about the defenders listening who are going to want to go and play in the sandboxes. And by the way, I'd love it if you could send me some links that I can put uh, on the show notes where they can kind of start playing with some of these sandboxes. Um, yeah. But I was thinking about, you know, be careful defenders, be careful in what you apply this to. Um, you know, you let, you're not finding, and I think I learned this from you, Josh, be careful that you're not finding a solution in search of a problem. Um, you know, don't just do it because you can. Um, and I think about like kind of, you know, in the early days of the web and Photoshop, like we were, we were applying drop shadows and bevel and embossed to, to like everything. You remember that? It was good, <laughs> and, good and times, now, good times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Yes. Beds, bevel, embossed, drop shadow. Um, that now, you know, when we have flat design and then, well, Apple did it. So we, everybody should just do flat design now. Not, not necessarily. You know, I, I just want to encourage you defenders listening to, you know, have a purpose in mind that will, it will do good and, and solve real needs when you do this. Don't just do it because you can, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I, I think that is so important, especially as we think about what we would choose to put out into the world as, as a product and for, and for broad use. I think it's, it's useful to distinguish too, sort of what we do just to play and to practice in our own sort of private laboratory, you know, before we sort of take it out into the public is that I think it's also okay to make some frivolous toys and to, mm. and to be silly because in a way that helps us to get outside of our own heads and outside of our own routines. And so mm. because machine learning helps us solve problems in a different way than we might be accustomed to, it's sometimes helpful to try to solve different kinds of problems. And sometimes making toys, making something silly helps us think differently. You know, it sort of it brings out that sort of childlike sense of possibility and imagination that we might not bring, I hate to say, day to day to our own sort of professional work. Um, so, yeah, you know, yeah. I think there's one just sort of fun example uh, that I like to show uh, that's called Giorgio, uh, which is something that some Google developers made, gosh, I don't know, about a year ago. And it strings together some of these publicly available APIs. And so it just works right in the browser, uh, and, and at least on, uh, on Chrome, on Android phones, for example. You can just have it just, just bring up the web page and you point the camera at something and it identifies it and makes up a little wrap about it. You know, so it, it's basically sort of sending out this, <laughs> it's grabbing the image, sending it to image recognition, getting that back, 
playing it through speech, you know, it, with in, with some sort of music behind it. Uh, and it's this sort of fun little toy, but it's sort of saying, mm. you know, it's like, I, I don't know, what, what, what could we make by stringing together different things, you know? So it's like, oh, I've got an image recognition API, great, and I'll run that through a translator and then through a, a, a speech synthesis thing. And it's like, wow, now I can actually take a picture of anything and have that translated live, have that recognized and translated into, I don't know, Japanese and maybe speak that out loud in both languages. And now I've turned the entire world into a flashcard for learning Japanese. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's like, make some stuff, see what's possible, especially yeah. by chaining some of these publicly available APIs together. And I don't know, see what, see what you make. I'm so glad you said that, Josh. And I, I appreciate that as well, because I think, you know, and I'm not discouraging you defenders from playing. And I'm, I'm really glad you said that, Josh, because I, I think about when we're children, right? Like there's no bound, there's no, there's no limit to what we can do and with our imaginations and, and kids are just fearless. Right. And they, and that's, and they're making, like, when you look at it, like as an adult, like some of it looks like, like some of the crayons look like a Smurf suicide or something, right? The crayon drawings, like, it's like, you're just like, Oh, yeah, but, but you know what? It's awesome for kids. And I think we need to kind of have a, a kind of a, a beginner mindset and a, and a more of a childish approach to, to learning new things, especially technologies like this. So I, I'm really glad you said that like defenders do play with it, do play. You'll, you'll, you'll build those neural connections. You'll, you'll form those neural connections and those ideas will, will kind of um, offer input into other, ideas that will be a real business, a real world business and user problem. So I, I really appreciate you uh, correcting me on that um, and, and kind of adding, adding more context to, to that. Um, but I, yeah, I, please, I also think, about think of the, it not as, yeah. a, as a correction, but as a supplement, because I, okay. I think you're okay. completely right that uh, we don't need more frivolous products and services in the world. But I think yeah. that, that but a little play in our own practice is helpful. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, and, and the lorem ipsum generator, here's another like kind of seemingly simple, but I think useful tool somebody took it upon themselves to create, uh, you know, our, our dread, dreaded lorem ipsum that we, we tend to have to put in like all of our mocks and stuff that don't mean anything and confuse clients. Oftentimes, uh, somebody came up with a, an AI generator that basically you, you put in some keywords of whatever area of focus the business is or the product is, um, or whatever, website you're trying to make, you put in a few keywords and it'll actually go and scrape like Wikipedia or wiki, whatever stuff. And it'll pull in like real, like germane data into your mock. So it's like, that's just one of those things. Like it probably didn't take that much effort for that person to develop that, but it's very useful. So I, I think that there's things like that, that, you know, that you can play with. And that was probably a result of him doing the same thing or he or she doing the same thing, you know, playing and then coming up with something that actually does solve a problem. So I love that. That's really yeah. good great encouragement. Yeah. That's a great. Um, that's a great example. So I have a listener question and I really like this one. And this happens to be from the gal that actually, whose idea sparked this conversation, uh, Josh, her name is Sherry Benko and her Twitter handle is uh, Sheetwise design. This is Sherry Benko. I'm a user experience researcher and designer at general dynamics. I've been involved in the AI industry for about three years and have formed my own opinion on how to answer this question. But as a good UXer, I like to ask other people's opinions to help inform my own approach. So my question is this, when should UX get involved in the AI workflow and how would you recommend that we do it? Oh, that's, I love it. Uh, and I love, Sherry, that you're interested in that. Um, you know, I, I think it, it goes back to a lot of what we were talking about earlier. I think that in particular, thinking about the research of really understanding the people and process that we're aiming to help and where they run into kind of gaps of insight or of kind of mountains of, frankly, joyless work where the machines could help to both save that joyless work and offer insight are really important things. I, you know, where basically I think that UX has a really important and particularly the reach research side has a really important role of saying, uh, where we should, where the data scientists should, should, should point their algorithms. Um, and I think then also looking at the presentation of it, I think that it's the kind of thing it's really, I think uh, in particular, um, I think that we are maybe have been a little bit complicit in that sort of fantasy of what the algorithms are able to do in terms of sort of really 
our interfaces tend to report at face value their recommendation. And so I've mentioned this a few different times, but ultimately I feel like so many of our machine generated interfaces have an overconfidence problem that is not really mm. at the source of the algorithm itself, but that the interface represents the information as completely true or the algorithm might be sort of like, man, I'm only 50% sure, sure about this. So I think part of the work that we have to do as an industry is start to develop some of the, the interface and interaction design patterns to express the proper amount of confidence. I think that that's, that that's one piece. I think that we also have a really dangerous uh, moment about uh, bias in our data. I mentioned this earlier. I think this is another place where UX can be super helpful, both in helping to prevent sort of bad bias uh, as much as possible and also surface it in the algorithm when, where necessary. But what I'm talking about here is that the machines only know what we give them. And when we look at, and, and the risk is, is that, it, well, I think that there's a hope and an assumption that the machines can be more objective than, than people, that perhaps if the machines are making decisions, they will not, you know, they will not have the same kind of human bias that we bring to our own decisions. But when you look at, for example, systems that are determining prison sentencing based on history or profile, when we look at hiring and promotion, things like that, you know, we are giving these systems data based on our past and based on metrics of the past. So if we have sort of an, an overly naive model that says, that tries to predict who will be the next great CEO of the company, that is going to, you know, historically favor, you know, tall, white, middle-aged men, you know, and it's like, well, that's not great. That's not a diverse or, or really adequate solution. The idea being, in other words, that by using our own historical data, we may freeze that history into the operating system of our culture itself. And so how can mm. we, it, so first of all, I think it's important to note that correcting that historical bias is itself a kind of bias, you know, and that, but ignoring the fact that there's bias at all in the system means that it, it's just not being honest with ourselves. And so I think part of it is, how can we as, as UX professionals help to understand where there may be points of bias, really understanding the, um, the, the, the culture of the domain that we're looking at and making sure that we're getting training data from all types of people within that audience uh, and not just people who look like the team developing it, for example. And I don't mean just in terms of race or age or ethnicity, um, but also in terms of kind of worldview, you know, it's sort of, I think that technologists have a very specific worldview that can taint data that's drawn from them. How do we get also people of all classes, countries, creeds, but also professions and worldviews of philosophers and artists and politicians and, you know, everybody who contributes to our, to our, um, our culture. So I think that there's, that's another aspect of where are we going to mine for data? How, what is the responsible sort of uh, way to go? And where, what are the possible biases? And how might we correct them? Or what are the risks? And how can we surface them? I think you know it is alarming when the machines sort of naively surface their own bias, you know, and you see these really, I would say, painful examples of it pop up where, you know, I think it was three or four years ago now, Google Photos identifying black people in pictures as gorillas. Incredibly painful yeah. and just it's awful, so right? Um, yeah. Where you have um, uh, in New Zealand, there was an example of uh, a man of Asian descent who was applying for a passport online and the machine wouldn't accept it because it thought his eyes were closed. You know, it's sort of just like the man just wasn't trained on a broad enough sort of set of data. And it, on the one hand, that is incredibly painful, but it also at least surfaces that bias in a way that we can address it. And I think that one thing that we've seen in our own culture with the Me Too movement, for example, is that at the right moment, when really painful and unpleasant facts are surfaced in a system, they can be addressed and perhaps fixed. And so I think that when we, if we think about that in our own 
way when we look at sort of the, the, the bias that, again, can be painful to be surfaced and the machines are just surfacing it in this naive way based on the data they've been given, we can say, man, this is something that we should fix. We should apply our own bias to address this. The trick is, as we do this, is, and this is another, I think, conversation that UX folks can lead, is sort of what are the values of our system that we're creating? You know, what do we want it to achieve from a, a human and cultural perspective as well as a business perspective? I think this is a tricky thing because right now, you know, it's like it is all big companies effectively that are defining the values, either intentionally or unintentionally. Who gets to decide? And one thing that we've seen in our culture right now is that reasonable people can have incredibly different notions of what fairness and justice should look like. And uh, I don't know the right solution for that, but I think that the idea that sort of naively believing that we're not embedding our systems with some notion of fairness and justice is, is uh, you know, as I say, naive, and we need, to, we need to at least be intentional about it. Hi, I'm Liza Kindred, founder of Mindful Technology, and I fight for the users. You're listening to User Defenders Podcast with Jason Ogle. Mm. Such a great answer, Josh. Uh, I, I want to encourage the defenders listening to, you know, as Josh was touching on, you know, bring those skills in of, of you know, psychology and of, of your art, of the po poets, you know, philosopher, philosophy, all of those things that, that you do bring that in to, to this because we, you know, as we are trying to make machines that are, that do act and behave more human, which makes sense. Uh, let's make sure that we're bringing that with us uh, for sure. So I, I appreciate that you know and psychology has been a really uh, fascinating subject for me uh, especially of late and so I, I feel like that you know defenders I really want to encourage you just learn more about how the brain works how it behaves and processes and and always be practicing and building up your empathy skills you know I always say empathy is a choice that becomes easier to make the more we practice it so I want to definitely encourage you listeners on that um, you know Josh a couple more here I, I have I'm a big critic of Siri as uh, you know as I mentioned before my my response um, and how often, you know, she gets things wrong. And you know, we even personify her as, as a she is, you know, that's kind of how we've been trained, you know, but she does get things right very often, you know, and I can add eggs to my Costco list as long as I say Costco, like I can do that in bed by talking to my wrist like Dick Tracy. You know, are we living in an age that the disgraced uh, Louis C.K. calls, quote, everything's awesome and nobody's happy? You know, in other words, do you feel like we take these amazing, uh, albeit flawed technologies for granted? And if so, why do we do that? Uh, you know, I would say yes and no. You know, it's like uh, sometimes these things do cost us time, right? That if sometimes it is, it would have just been faster not to have asked Siri in the first place, right? And when they work, right. they are amazing. And I think I think part of it is is the the fact that. Uh, even though the error rate might be lower than we realize, we just feel that error uh, more often, mm -hmm. that we feel that mistake. Because especially with voice interfaces, they're time-consuming mistakes. You know, it's like, oh, man, I just yeah. lost a minute talking to Siri, and I could have just <laughs> looked it up myself, right? And so it, part of it is some of the tasks that these things enable are, are you know, kind of low-effort tasks to fulfill that are, are worth having the machine do if they can do them quickly, you know, if there's no cost to it. And so I think part yeah. of the thing that we have to do as designers is, you know, I think that it's okay to solve small problems as long as the cost of using those solutions is low. And so I think that our responsibility is to make sure that that cost is low um, and that it can recover quickly or, or repay that expense when things go badly. Um, and so, you know, I, I think partly it's, I think part of the problem too here that we can help with as designers is that I think when I talk about designing for failure and for uncertainty, what it really means, and this has always been true in all kinds of interfaces, but I think it's especially true here, is that our job is really to set appropriate expectations for the system's ability and then channel behavior in ways that match that system's ability. Um, so it's really, you know, just being super honest about what the thing can do. And I would say that there's a real challenge for designers of, of systems like Siri and Alexa because what they're capable of is a moving target. They get more capable every day. 
Um, mm. And so it's not a fixed system to design for, or to educate for. But, uh, but their promise is ask me anything. And, uh, you know, right. you ask and you don't get the answer. That's not a, it's not a good promise. It isn't setting the expectation correctly. And again, mm-hmm. this is, I, I don't say this at all to diminish, uh, the Alexa and Siri designers. On the contrary, it's a really interesting thorny problem of how do you educate against a vast possibility of, of capabilities, of real capabilities that they can really answer without an, uh, with a really low resolution interface like speech, you know, how do you sort of over time start to introduce those capabilities in ways that don't just drain tons of time for the part of the user? So I think that there's real possibility here. I think that there's also that those kind of, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? These little tiny expenses <laughs> that you accrue by trying to use Siri and it not working despite its, its overall success as a, as a product. It's, a amazing, it's an amazing technical achievement. But as designers, yeah, yeah. you know, how do we save that expense and help to educate in ways to use it, use the systems in ways that won't frustrate us. Uh, great, great answer, Josh. Uh, technology is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. There's a, a guy named John Culkin uh, who uh, was a reverend in New York uh, in the 60s. I, I'm not sure if he's still around or not, but at the time he was a, a friend of Marshall McLuhan. And he has this lovely line that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And, uh, you know, that. we create these things and they have these follow on effects that, that change the way that we behave or the way that we say Costco. Um, and it's a little bit like Kranzberg's first law that I mentioned early, earlier. You know, the technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. It has these effects that we don't necessarily realize, but after we put them out into the world, they, they, they change us. Mm. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Josh, this is my last question for you. Um, and it's, I like to end on a bang sometimes. I, this has been just such an incredible deep dive. Um, and, and I think this is going to be reference material for many, many, many years to come. But I want to ask you this last question. I'm kind of building it up. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm excited and nervous. <laughs> so if today was your last day on earth, what would be your final plea to designers and developers, engineers, building the future of AI and machine learning that our kids and potentially their kids will be experiencing and even building off of? I think that the biggest thing, you know, we've been talking around this a lot, is to really recognize that software is, a, is embedded with values and even with politics. Uh, and that to ignore that is to really sort of willfully ignore the potential impact that they're going to have on the world. And that, uh, you know, values and politics are highly fraught right now, but it's important to be intentional about the values that we're cooking into these uh, systems through the training data that we give them, through the people we choose to gather that training data from, by the people we choose to um, to impose the system upon. Uh, let's be intentional about what kind of effects we want this thing to have. We may not be able to control those effects. This is again, you know, Kranzberg's first law. We don't we don't always know exactly how it's going to turn out, good or bad. But let's be really intentional about the values that we believe will make a better, fairer, more just world. Uh, and, um, and I think that some of those values go to, you know, how can we be respectful of our own humanity, right? And amplify, uh, uh, amplify our humanity and the things that we are best at. Um, but I think also just sort of broadly is, you know, when we think about the bias that these systems will inherently have, um, how do we want to bias it? You know, what, what is the bias toward the, the right kind of world and how do we possibly, have a conversation where we can agree on what that world might look like. Hmm. Oh, amen, brother. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, so Josh, as we close here, what is, what's the best way for the defenders listening to connect and to keep up with you? Cause I know they're going to want to. 
Well, thanks. I I, uh, I tweet occasionally at Big Medium Josh, uh, and I'm also at BigMedium.com. That's like the two sizes, big and medium, uh, where I occasionally blog. And um, I, I show up at conferences and, and give talks about this stuff uh, sometimes. That's uh, also available on the speaking page of my of, of my website at BigMedium.com. And uh, if you happen to show up at one of those, please say hello. Ah, excellent. So uh, finally, Josh, the, the, you said this, the machines know only what we feed them. And I want to implore you, defenders listening, uh, those of you f- regularly feeding the machines, I implore you to keep them on a steady diet of empathy, humility, servitude, and humanity. Josh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for spending a good chunk of time with me talking about this stuff. Uh, I, I I feel like we're just going to be dive. We're going to be uh, surfacing from the well. It's going to probably take a little while, but we've we've gone real deep here, and I, I'm so appreciative uh, of what you've what you've how you've done that. You've made this conversation such a deep dive, and and so thank you so much for all the work you're doing and getting this message out there for making the world a better place. You truly are. It's not you're, it's not just a Silicon Valley. You know, I want to make the world a better place. You really are. So please, please, my friend, as always fight on my friend (laughs) thanks so much and uh thank you for creating such a great forum for helping all of us uh uh, do all that good stuff of making the world better thank you thanks my friend wow right i really love josh's encouragement for us to play more in splash and puddles that's really the only way that we who are interested in this stuff can truly learn and grow and fail small to learn big This conversation was so deep and had me thinking about it for weeks after. I'm so grateful for Josh Clark and taking as much time as was needed to cover all of this because as you just heard, there is a lot to talk and think about. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was about the emergence and proliferation of AI and what it means for us as designers. The more I think about this and what Kevin Kelly declares as to the effect of there will be other jobs for us to do besides the normal things we're used to now even. The the more I think about that, actually the more hopeful I am as a knowledge worker that we will have more time to think, to dream, to truly create and innovate even more than we possibly can currently. Uh, The 80-20 rule can also probably be applied to this thinking. It's also known as Pareto's Law. And the sentiment of the 80-20 rule is that that 20% of our efforts will typically produce 80% of the results. So in this case, seeing as how 80% of the efforts may already be being done for us by the machines, perhaps that 20% that matters will matter even more and bring forth even greater innovation than what we are currently capable of producing with deadlines and things related to the grind behind producing our ideas. So I know that's that's purely a speculation, but I wonder if it's not that far from the truth. Only time will tell. Tweet your takeaways, defenders. Uh, I, as, as you know, and as I just mentioned, there's a lot to be discussed, and I'd love to see a conversation started on Twitter about this subject matter, uh, I'm at user defenders and Josh is at big medium Josh. I'm sure he would love to, to also jump in to this conversation. So uh, thanks so much. Um, I, I, my call to action, what would it be? How about get on the biweekly bugle? I've simplified the email format a ton. It's like a friend to a friend and that's kind of what I want. And that's reinforcing the iTunes review that I read earlier um, about just wanting to come across. I want to be your friend. (laughs) I need more friends, defenders. (laughs) Um, So yeah, just check it out if you would. It's a great way to kind of see what's going on with the show behind the scenes. There's a lot of first things that I announce um, there as opposed to on Twitter. So just a great way to do that and to connect with me. I'm on the other side of the reply button. So check it out. Go to userdefenders.com slash join to get on that. In two weeks, Defenders, I have Denise Jacobs, the one and only. And she wrote uh, the book literally on overcoming imposter syndrome. It's called Banish Your Inner Critic. And I highly recommend it. 
It is so good. And uh, the conversation is so good. It's so good that there's going to be two parts because my first conversation with Denise, we, we just went off the cuff. There was nothing really that planned. And I ended up only asking her one of my questions because we just really dove deep real fast. So it's going to be good. So check that out. Oh, subscribe too. There's another call to action. Subscribe so you automatically receive it. You don't have to go and search for it. It'll automatically show up on wherever you play your podcast. So um, go to userdefenders.com slash subscribe to do that. So thanks so much for listening, Defenders. Thanks for suggesting wonderful show topics like this. Um, I'm always open to hear your ideas. Uh, even if it's a, like a monologue thing, like I'm going to be uh, doing some monologue stuff that I've never done before, really. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. The first one's going to be on imposter syndrome, uh, interestingly enough. So it's going to be uh, really well themed with my conversation with Denise. So anyway, thanks so much for listening again. I appreciate you. And uh, until next time, fight on, my friends. Mm-hmm.